Okay, well today we're going to be talking about the drama of Luigi Pirandello. Uh, Freud, as I mentioned last time, had a tremendous impact on artists, on playwrights, on novelists, um, on thinkers in the social sciences, and literary types of all sorts. And so here we see one example of, in part, Freudian influence. In part, I think we have a phenomenon that is larger than Freud himself. Freud is the exemplar of a much larger phenomenon. A lot of people came back from World War I with the sense that somehow, by serving in the trenches, they had seen the horrifying underbelly of civilization, or maybe better yet, the horrifying reality that underlay the entire thing, that civilization was a thin veneer over something disgusting. Imagine that you've got a piece of furniture that has a veneer on it. The veneer cracks, you look beneath it, and you just find a bunch of termites that have eaten apart the wood. Well, it's like that, except in this case, more horrifying. Maybe something like, well, seeing a body, right, underneath. Um, like, did I, I told you about the incident my daughter experienced recently? No. Child fell in the playground, um, cut his knee wide open. I mean, you could see bone, you could see tendons, everything else. Um, and most teachers were kind of like, <laughs> right? She was one of the few to reach up, rush over there and, you know, it doesn't bother her to sort of deal with all that. But it was that sense of you take the surface and you rip open and to see what's underneath and there's something horrifying. There's something there that Freud is describing as the subconscious mind. Here, we see Pirandello talking about masks, illusions, the conscious mind, and in a larger sense, all of civilization, as a construct there to hide a horrifying underlying reality. So, here we see Pirandello himself talking to actors about how to perform this play. He was himself very active in the theater, not merely as a playwright, but actually helping to direct and putting on these things. He was uh, not at all the sort who just sat in his study and turned out things for other people to produce. He was born, appropriately enough, in a town called Chaos, Sicily. <laughs> um, and for those of you who remember Get Smart, the old TV show, it's spelled like that. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1934. His dramas were really of a kind that nobody had ever seen before. Um, so much so that people didn't quite know what to make of them. Here you see him typing out uh, a manuscript on one of those old-fashioned typewriters, something that was quite new at the time, though it now looks very old-fashioned to us. Pirandello was shocking partly because he did things that were, well, utterly in defiance of traditional norms of the theater. You walk into a theater to see a play, and what do you expect to have happen? You expect the characters to come out. They are in character, right? They are performing. They are appearing. Yes, it's actors and actresses, but they are performing in a certain context as these characters. You expect them to obey the rules of those settings, and if it's a drama, it goes a certain way, and if it's a comedy, it goes some other way, and so on. Well, he broke a lot of those conventions. When this was first performed in Rome, there was a riot. People were furious. After all, look at the title. Six characters in search of an author. This is not the way plays were normally constructed. People did not know what to make of it. The production moved to Milan, and there it was a great success. But at first, it was so different, so astounding to ordinary sensibilities, that people were angry. People started shouting. They got up from their seats. Fist fights broke out. It was something like the opening of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, where people did not know what to make of this. So what's going on in six characters? Well, <laughs> all sorts of things. Here we see, and actually someone said, you're doing it wrong. And there is a sense in which it feels like, or at least it felt like to those early participants, those people who walked in and didn't know what they were getting into as if Pirandello himself was doing it wrong. As if like, no, this isn't what a play is. This isn't what a playwright does. This isn't what characters do. What on earth is going on here? So, let's take a look at the underlying themes. I want to alert you to these before we get to the actual play, because otherwise you won't have a clue about what's going on. But question back there. I was just going to ask what the actual plot was, but I guess you can Oh, we'll get to the plot, yeah. I want to talk about the themes so that we can start seeing them as the thing goes by. Because this is a, well, if you've read this, you realize it's sort of hard to describe the plot of this. <laughs> um, 
it's a bunch of characters wandering, wandering on stage as people are about to rehearse a play, and they kind of take over and say, we want to tell our story. And uh, so it's a very strange setup. It's as if you go to hear a band play, right? And they take the stage, and they're getting ready on their instruments, they're tuning up, and all of a sudden, these other people come in, and they start saying, well, you know, um, we're going to tell, we're going to do our music here. And they're like, well, we've well, we got this story to tell. And, you know, it's like, wait, what? What's happening? Now, one theme here, look for this again and again, is disappointment. The thought is that life is disappointing. Jimmy Carter once said, life is unfair. <laughs> well, here in a way, the point is, life is disappointing. Life is something that is not set up to give you what you want. So disappointment is inevitable. Now, you might think civilization is set up to try to help with that problem, but no. <laughs> Actually, social norms make it even worse. Socially acceptable behavior is an even greater disappointment. Our social norms are utterly bankrupt. So what you're supposed to do, what is appropriate behavior in certain situations, all of that is just, again, part of the disguise. And it doesn't work. It's not as if it's a disguise that lets you get what you want. It's more like a disguise that doesn't do anything for you. And so it's not um, something that solves certain human problems. It just takes certain problems and amplifies them. It takes other problems and, in the name of solving them, creates yet more problems. He talks a lot about a hopeless emptiness. There's a sense in which he thinks life is ultimately empty. empty. And it's also hopeless. <laughs> wow. <is> the <laughs> yeah, that's a. I feel like, you know, there's been a cosmic drum roll. God saying, emptiness? <laughs> In any event, yes, he thinks that life is empty, that life doesn't have any meaning. The question of the meaning of life is something we're going to encounter again and again in this course as people try to figure out whether there's any role for norms in our life, and if so, what it is, that's connected to the question of what our life means. And we're going to see some people who think that it does have a predetermined meaning, others who think it's up to you. We've talked about that theme with that contrast between Tolstoy and Nietzsche that Fitzgerald talks about. Here we see an idea that really, in the end, life is empty. <laughs> life doesn't have much of any meaning. And moreover, he's not an optimist, as some people will read are, and say, well, the fact that it's empty of meaning means you get to give it a meaning. Here, it's just hopeless, right? It's not like it's empty so that you can fill it up with something good. It's empty, and it's hopeless, and there's nothing you can do to make it any better. He must have been a fun guy to hang out with. <laughs> But actually, the plays are very funny. That's the irony of this. It's not at all hopeless in the sense of, I mean, these are really enjoyable. But here is another theme, and here he is very close to Freud. Reality is utterly irrational. Remember Nietzsche's thought that instead of progressing in law-like, rational ways, thought progresses in ways that are ultimately irrational, driven by the will to power, driven by illusion, driven by our underlying biochemistry that in the end, none of it makes much sense in rational terms. Pirandello agrees with that. In that respect, he's a student of Nietzsche. He's somebody who says reality itself is actually irrational. It's not just that our minds are irrational and thought progresses in irrational ways. When we peel back that surface, when we take off the mask, we see that reality itself is irrational. And so he's fascinated by contradictions. He's fascinated by <coughs> chaos by things having no order at all, by, by it being a complete mess under you. And he thinks, ultimately, that the nature of the world is unknowable, partly because it is an irrational mess. There's nothing you can do to give it any rational structure or order. And so in the end, the truth of things, deep down, is that things are just irrational. They don't make any sense. So they're utterly unknowable. This theme that reality is, in some sense, unknowable is something that we're going to see in a number of occasions, of course. But there is something special about this idea that reality contains contradictions. Um, and that thought contains contradictions. Uh, for most thinkers throughout the entire history of the world, that's been kind of an absurdity. But there were schools of thought in Asia and India that took this very seriously. In Buddhism, for example, um, people take seriously the idea that something might be true, it might be false, it might be neither true nor false. It might be both true and false. 
And in fact, in Jainism, this gets further developed. It might be that it's true or false or indeterminate, or true and false, or true and indeterminate, or indeterminate and false, or true and false and indeterminate. <laughs> and, and sometimes the Buddhists will say things like, oh yes, it could be that, or it could be none of the above. And what's going on there is that people are thinking, we should take seriously the idea that reality really contains contradictions deep down. Um, we're going to come back to this, but there was a very popular book published in 1911 called <laughs> The Philosophy of As If by Hans Feiner. And he argues that really all of our rational ways of understanding the world are constructs where we're pretending. We're acting as if the world is a certain way. None of them get it right. The world isn't actually like that. The world isn't structured enough to be like any of that. And he says, moreover, there's a clue at some point that all of these things are constructs and artificial and not capturing reality, which is that all of them are ultimately contradictory. And so I think in the background here is not just Nietzsche, but Weiner, that idea that in some way we create these approximate models that are really illusions thinking the world is really like that when it isn't like that. It's too complicated to fit into that scheme. And all those schemes in the final analysis really end up being contradictory. Well, finally, he thinks then that there is no such thing as objective, tr objective truth. There's no objectivity. There is no predictability to the world. The world is just a chaotic series of events. They don't really fall in the, under any patterns. They don't have any structure. There's no way to make it seem rational. All of this is also true of the self. In the end, you don't have any clear identity. If I say, who are you deep down? You might not know how to answer. And remember, I talked about Erickson's stages of life. One of those stages is at the stage where you're trying to figure out your own identity. You're at that stage now, if you're at all typical. You're going through that thing of thinking, well, who am I ultimately? Well, Pirandello would say, relax. <laughs> You don't have any clear identity, and it's not just that you don't have it now, you're never going to have it. There is no such thing as a clear identity to self. Moreover, what we call the conscious mind is really a multiplicity. It is really a series of masks we use in interacting with the world. And so, in the end, who we are, what we are, that's completely mysterious to us. We have these masks, we have these illusions we put out there, we play certain roles, but underneath all of that, occasionally the mask slips. Occasionally, we fall out of the role. We think, what am I really? And it's too horrifying to contemplate. We quickly put the mask back in place. Now, what that means is, to the extent that it exists at all, the self is kind of plastic. It's really something we can shape to look a certain way at a certain time, but it doesn't have any underlying character. Did any of you as kids have one of these things where you had molds, and you put plastic into the thing, and you could shape it into whatever you wanted? Um, they're like super primitive 3D printers, <laughs> I guess. In any case, those things are like this. The self is like this. You know, you, you can shape it into a variety of things. It doesn't really have any character of its own. It adapts to circumstance. So you don't really have a character or an, or an identity. You take on a different role as you interact with different people, sometimes as student, sometimes as friend, sometimes as lover, sometimes as child, etc., etc. All of these are different fronts you present to different people. And then finally, of course, since these perspectives are highly mobile and your conception of self is highly mobile, in the end, everything is really, to some degree, an illusion. We never can really pull off the illusions, the mask, and look at reality, frankly, underneath. Occasionally, as, he, uh, as I mentioned, we get a little glimpse of it, and it's horrifying when we retreat. So here is how he himself described his work. I think that life is a very sad piece of buffoonery. Because we have in ourselves, without being able to know why, wherefore, or whence, the need to deceive ourselves constantly by creating a reality, one for each and never the same for all, which from time to time is discovered to be vain and illusory. My heart is full of bitter compassion for all those who deceive themselves. But this compassion cannot fail to be followed by the ferocious derision of destiny, which condemns man to deceive. So, in short, your life is full of self-deception. You are constantly hiding the reality of who you are and what the world is like from yourself. And yet occasionally, as I was putting it, the mask slips, occasionally you realize it is all vain. It is all an illusion. It's all something that is merely a mask. But that's 
itself a reality you'd prefer to hide from yourself. And so you quickly retreat behind those masks. That makes you ridiculous. He says, on one hand, you're just like every other human being. I have great compassion for you. But on the other hand, I also think you're ridiculous. I'm going to mock you <laughs> for being like this. Uh, so he thinks we're all in the same boat. It's not like, ha ha, you're wearing masks. <laughs> it's rather, hmm, we're all wearing masks all of the time. And most of the time, we ignore them. But sometimes we realize it. And then it makes us feel very uncomfortable. Now I look around this room and I can see a lot of people feeling very uncomfortable. <laughs> right, they, eh, maybe this is a little too close to home. <laughs> now, here is the way we might think about this. We've talked about two level theories, where there's a manifest image of the world, and then an underlying scientific image of the world that's ultimately responsible for the way things behave and responsible for the appearances that things have at that manifest level. Notice what this implies about this. That manifest image, he says, is not really a unified way of seeing the world. It's not really a unified way of seeing ourselves. It's really a bunch of different images. It would be more like saying there's a collage. It's the manifest collage of images that we somehow patch together and call that an image of the world or of ourselves. But it's really a bunch of different things, and they're always slipping around against each other. It's not like it has a very determined or intelligible structure. And what it hides what is really there at that scientific level, the underlying level, is this hideous subconscious reality. This thing that is too awful to comprehend. So Freud thinks he can give you a theory, ultimately, of what the id desires, and thinks, you know, only sometimes can you look at it without distortion. Pirandello basically says, look, I think underneath is something that I can't begin to tell you about. And it would be too horrible to face if I could tell you anything about it. So, what does it mean about meaning itself? Well, there really is no meaning to anything we do, at least nothing we can understand. And so we are, he says in the end, the author of our own realities. But just as an author can write many works, so we actually construct many selves. We play many roles. We construct many selves. We construct a lot of masks. And we, it's, I mean, it's awesome, isn't it, that we're doing this in October? Too bad we're not doing this on Halloween. Right? We brought in masks. Um, the one time I, on Halloween I tried to lecture in a mask, and I had at one point this huge frog head. That worked because it had a big like mouth. Right? <laughs> but otherwise, I, I, I got this allergic reaction. I started itching terribly, and I actually had to leave class and go find the bathroom and wash my face again and again. But I came back and my face was beet red, um, even redder than it normally is. <laughs> And so, so anyway, the point is this. We're constantly doing this, right? And not just on Halloween. We're always wearing a certain mask. Ah, I'm the concerned friend. Ah, I'm the jocular friend. I mean, think about how you are with your friends. Do you behave in exactly the same way with every friend? Probably not. With some people, you're always cracking jokes. Other people, you're serious. Some people you talk to about such and such. Some people you just talk about sports and so on and so forth. You're a different person. You're adopting a different mask on all those things. And those are just the friend masks, leaving aside how you behave toward your parents, or your teachers, and so on and so forth. So, sometimes these masks do slip, and we have to confront the truth, but all we can confront is really the truth that these are masks. And then we retreat. We can bear to confront things, but only up to a point. So now let's turn to the play. I think the play will, with that as background, start making more sense to you. If you jump in right off the top, it just seems absurdist. It seems as if nothing makes any sense. Now, there is a whole school of absurdist literature that ends up following from this, where things are just crazy. Eugene Ionesco um, is a playwright who does some wonderful things like The Bald Soprano, where just bizarre things happen. And the whole plays are just these wild, crazy, very funny, but utterly ridiculous things. Um, in some sense, all of that grows out of Pirandello. But it's not just a crazy series of things. It really does, in Pirandello, reflect this underlying view of things. So, we've got people who are preparing this play. Okay? And so the leading man of the play says to the manager, excuse me, but must I absolutely wear a cook's cap? The manager is annoyed. I imagine so. It says so there anyway. He points at the book, the script of the play. The leading man says, but it's ridiculous. The manager jumps up in a rage. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Is it my fault if France won't send us any more good comedies and we're reduced to putting on Pirandello's works 
where nobody understands anything and where the author plays the fool with us all. Now this is actually happening on stage, right? So you walk in and you find these people and it doesn't look like these are characters in a play. It looks like a bunch of people who are about to book a play. It's like you've walked in at the beginning of a rehearsal and you're hearing this argument between the director and an actor. And they start denouncing Pirandello and so on. It's, well, I think it's very funny. Um, but it's very surprising and not what people expect. <coughs> anyway, the actors grin. The manager goes to the leading man and shouts, Yes, sir, you put on that cook's cap and beat eggs. Do you suppose that with all the same beating business you're on an ordinary stage? Get that out of your head. You represent the shell of the eggs you are beating. And, well, then all the cop actors start talking to each other and laughing. Now, think about that for a moment. You represent the shell of the eggs you are beating. If you just encounter that, you might think, I have no idea what he's talking about. But I hope now you have some sense of what's going on here. What does he mean? You represent the shell. There you go. There you are. <laughs> Say it again. Well, ah, well, one thing is you're weak. You're pretty fragile, right? The shell of the egg, something easily broken, something easily shattered. Yeah. Positively or negatively. <laughs> oh, well, good. The shell is something that keeps everything together. So, yes, good point. It's something that is fragile on the one hand, but on the other hand, holds it together, makes it into one thing and so has a positive role to play. Also, I mean, what else can you tell me about the shell of an egg? Yeah? It's like the mask. It's like the mask, right? It's the, look, what is an egg? Oh, it's this nice white little spheroid thing. And then you break it open, it's like, oh, it's a Right? Look at the horrifying, goopy reality of it. Well, okay, so beat the eggs. <laughs> now, notice what happens when you beat the eggs. You're taking what little structure they seem to have and messing with it further, right? Destroying even that. So the fragility and yet the importance of the shell is something like this. Look, it is hiding that underlying reality, but for a good reason. After all, um, well, for example, in the grocery store, I sometimes am looking for eggs and I open a carton and one of them is cracked. And I always look carefully. Has the goo started leaking out of it? Or is it just a crack in the shell that still has that inner membrane intact? If it's got the inner membrane intact, I buy it anyway. That's the thing that's actually protecting you from bacteria. Um, but the important thing here is this. Uh, it is protecting the egg. And your mask, these illusions, are doing that to you. They're not only presenting a face to the outside world, they're keeping you together. They're protecting you. And so they're playing an important role. When they break, there's a real danger. And so, what's going on in this play? In part, look, you represent the shell of the eggs you're beating. There are things in life that destroy the structure here, that break the shell, that mess with what's inside, but the shell is playing an important role. Now, silence. Listen to my explanations, please, says the director. To the leading man, the empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct which is blind. <coughs> you stand for reason, your wife is instinct. It's a mixing up of the part, according to which you whack your own part, become a puppet of yourself. Do you understand? The leading man says, I'm hanged if I do. The manager says, well, neither do I. Well, let's get on with it. It's sure to be a glorious failure anyway. Now, let's think about this silence. The empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct, which is blind. What on earth does that mean? Notice it's not even a complete sentence. The empty form of reason without the fullness of instinct, which is blind. Yeah? The way I interpret it is like everyone has their own view of reason. Like there's no definitive reason at all. So that's why it's an empty form, is that it, it can take any form at once. And then instinct is blind, as in it just does whatever it can once in the moment. And without the instincts, there is no reason at all in the first place. Ah, good, good, good. Yes, notice one claim here. Uh, reason itself being this empty form is something that can be used for lots of different purposes, right? Lots of things could fill it. And so here's the one claim, it's empty. 
But secondly, that does imply, like a container, it could be filled with lots of things. I just read a joke this morning that's pretty humorous. God, the border guard has been seeing this guy cross the border day after day for 30 years, every day carrying a suitcase. The guy looks suspicious, and every day the border guard checks through the suitcase, convinced that he's a smuggler, but there's never anything illegitimate in the suitcase. So he lets him go on. Finally, after 30 years of this, the guy comes up with his suitcase, and the guy's checking through it, and he says, he says, listen, this is my last day. You won't see me again. I'm retiring, and I'm moving to Bermuda. And the guard says, listen, I, look, since you won't be back, since it's all over, this has been driving me crazy. I'm sure you're a smuggler, but I can't figure out what you're smuggling. You are a smuggler, aren't you? And the guy says, yeah. And the border guard says, well, what are you smuggling that for 30 years I've been searching for and I've never found? The guy says, suitcases. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Here it's a bit like that, right? I mean, it's like reason is this suitcase. Reason is this thing that's empty by itself, but it could be filled with different things for different purposes. And so one way of looking at this is it's highly variable. It doesn't play this universal objective role that people have traditionally assigned to it. Then look at the other side of it, the fullness of instinct, which is blind. Instinct by itself is blind. It doesn't really have any definite direction. Let's say you suddenly feel anger. That anger is itself blind. What exactly are you angry about? That requires reason. The anger itself is highly indeterminate. And so his point is really, well, in a sense, e take either of these by itself. It doesn't quite make any sense. There is an echo here of Immanuel Kant, who at some point, a crucial point in the critique of pure, pure reason, says that concepts without intuitions are empty, and intuitions without concepts are blind. Here, by intuitions, he means actually sensations. But apply it here and think of it as instinct. The idea is that these concepts, reason, without other things to fill them in, without any motivating force, as with instinct, doesn't do anything. It's empty. It by itself does nothing for us. In fact, we've seen an argument very much like this earlier in Hume where reason by itself can't motivate. It requires desire. It requires something else to actually do the motivating, feeling. And here, the problem with feeling by itself is that it's totally blind. You have to, in some way, get the feeling and the reason together. You stand for reason, your wife is instinct. It's a mixing up of the part. Now, you, who act your own part, become the puppet of yourself. What about that part? What does that mean? You're the puppet of yourself. You're acting your own part. Yeah? You're the leader of your own actions. Good. You're the leader of your own actions. You're the author of your own actions. How does that make you the puppet of yourself? Yeah? It's kind of like a mask thing, I think. As in, like, you're putting on a performance to be something that isn't you, but at the same time is you. Good. Exactly. Exactly. Every time you interact with anyone or do anything, you're putting on a performance. You're acting a certain role. You're putting on one of the masks, one of the illusions. And so right now, for example, I have my professor mask on. And I'm doing my professor thing, OK? And that's one of the roles that I play. That's one of the masks that I have, Pirandello would say. And so right now, I'm acting my own part. But of course, then in different settings, I'm acting a very different role. When I'm playing music, I'm one of the players, and I'm actually always playing with people that are better than I am. Um, I'd like to brag about that, but if you're bad enough, you're always playing with people who are better than you. Uh, but no, some of them are very, very good. Anyway, in those cases, I'm hardly the professor. I'm not the one who says, hey, wait a minute, no, I think that shouldn't be that, or why did you, you know. They're the ones who are telling me, oh, don't do that, <laughs> do this other thing. And so, in short, it's something that, well, involves playing a certain role, acting according to a certain mask, in a certain situation, with a certain friend, with a certain group of people, when you're interacting in a certain way. And so you're really acting your own part. You are the one who has created these masks. You're the one who defines what your role is going to be in this friendship, or in this relationship, and so on. And then you act that part. So in that sense, you're a puppet of yourself. It's as if you are saying, OK, in this setting, I am like this. Right? With your friends, maybe you're the life of the party. You're constantly cracking jokes. But you come into my office because you're appalled at your paper grade and want to do better on the next one. 
Are you constantly cracking jokes? Are you like, you know, hey, yeah, I'll rewrite, but it's sure to be a glorious failure anyway. Uh, no. Well, look, of course you're not. You're coming in saying, I know I got a, I, like a 9.9 .9 out of 10, but why did I lose that point? I want that extra point, tenth of a point. Sorry, I've managed to insult you now with, by going to both extremes, haven't I? God. But you're not wrong. But I'm not wrong. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, now, the manager says, will you oblige me by going away? We have a time to waste with mad people. This is just after this troop of characters come in, the six characters in search of an author. They now come in and interrupt all this, and they say, um, we're here to tell our story. And the manager says, well, who are you people? What are you doing here? We're about to put on a play. Go away. <laughs> and they say, no, 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 we've got this story to tell. It's really important that we tell it. We're looking for somebody who will be an author to our characters to allow us to tell our story. The father here responds to this. Oh, sir, you know well that life is full of infinite absurdities, which strangely enough don't even need to appear plausible, since they're true. So the manager is basically saying, look, it's absurd. You characters just wander in here and want me to tell your story? Go away, we're about to put it on play. And they say, you know, life is full of absurdities. Yes, it's absurd that we walk in and want to tell our story, but life is full of absurdities. And, you know, hey, they don't need to appear plausible because they're true. Well, there is this theme of the absurd. We're going to confront this on a number of occasions. We'll see Albert Camus, for example, place this at the very center of his philosophy. We encounter absurdity, these absurd walls, as Camus puts it. And one of the very first people to take the absurd as a major theme is Pirandello. This idea that in ordinary life we confront these absurdities, that life contains infinite absurdities, and that it doesn't fully make sense. Now, when do we encounter these bits of absurdity, these things that seem to make no sense? That confrontation with the absurd is something probably all of us feel at some point. What are some examples? Yeah. Gender. Okay, gender might be that way, right? It might be that way for you. You feel like, wait, this is absurd. Um, you know, I'm, gosh, what's an example? Um, all of a sudden you find out you're supposed to dress in a certain way, and you think, wait, I'm, wait, I'm supposed to do that? Right? And it strikes you as absurd. Um, and so, I don't know, gosh. It, this can happen to all sorts of people, and you don't actually have to be gender non-conforming to feel this. I remember when I was about to get married, putting on a tuxedo for the first time, right? And the, this very frilly shirt, and the cummerbund, and so on. And at first, like, wait, I'm supposed to wear that? That's insane. That's all craziness, right? And then, actually, all of us had this sense. We all thought, this is absurd. We're going to look like these weird Renaissance people. We put this on, and then we were like, why don't we dress like this all the time? This is awesome. <laughs> but whatever you feel, things where there are like expectations like that, you might look at it and think, eh, that's absurd. That doesn't make any sense. What are some other situations where you might feel that? Yeah. Driving. Driving? Yeah, okay, good. Driving, you confront the absurd all the time. Do you have a particular kind of case in mind? Oh, like when you're like, someone cuts you off and you're like, wait. Ah, somebody cuts you off. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, maybe that just makes you angry, but often people do things that seem absurd, okay? You, of course, never do them, but people around you often do them. And it's like, wait, what? Um, the manager says, what the devil is he, is he talking about? And the father says, look, to reverse the ordinary process may well be considered a madness. That is to create credible situations in order that they may appear true. But he says, look, if that's madness, that's the whole reason for your profession, gentlemen. That's the whole point of a play, right? Actors, actresses, directors, stage managers. The point is to create credible situations that are not true but appear true. Well, the manager at this point is insulted. He says, you're thinking our profession is worthy of madmen? He says, well, to make seem true what isn't true without any need. That's your mission, to give life to fantastic characters on the stage. Now, I want to focus on that line. To make seem true that which isn't true. That is what is involved in literature. That's what invo is involved in putting on a play, in acting, in directing, in being a playwright. But notice, it's also what every one of us is doing all the time. You are trying to make seem true what isn't true. That's the point of these masks, the point of these illusions. 
You are trying to hide something from everybody else, but also from yourself. You are trying to create this persona, really a series of personas that you use to get through life. And all of them are masks. All of them are hiding the reality. You're trying to make it seem true that you're really like that. But in fact, they're all just roles you're playing. Well, here is a scene from the production with the characters now. The father, and it turns out the characters have this deep, hidden secret, which is eventually revealed near the end of the play. The father says each of us, when he appears before his fellows, is clothed in a certain dignity. But every man knows what unconfessable things pass within the secrecy of his own heart. One gives way to the temptation only to rise from it again with a great eagerness to reestablish one's dignity. Some folks haven't had the courage to say certain things. That's all. So here is that theme that underneath the masks is something unconfessable, something that is terrible, that none of us would want to admit. Freud gives us that image of the censor in the mind, keeping out unpleasant thoughts. But Pirandello says it's not exactly like that. It's not only in dreams that the censor gets a little lazy and allows things some to appear, but in distorted form. Actually, even in our conscious life, we are aware of thoughts that are appalling to us, that we'd never want to admit to, that we'd never confess. We have these thoughts that are part of what it is to be human, that we cannot face. We certainly don't make them part of the mask, the thing we see makes seem true to the rest of the world, we really don't even want to confront them ourselves. And yet, for a moment, we are confronted with them. We all have these thoughts that glimp, sort of blip through our minds, and maybe there's this moment, right, where the Freudian censor hasn't yet kicked in and pushed them aside. They get pushed aside, at least if we're psychologically healthy, they get pushed aside. Maybe one explanation for certain kinds of psychopathies is that they don't get pushed aside and they're allowed to actually grow and fester. But in any event, it's the kind of thing that is really there in all of us. We all have these unconfessable secrets. Now the stepdaughter is the one who, well, is cynical and says, all appear to have the courage to do them though. And the father says, yes, but in secret. Therefore, you want more courage to say these things. <coughs> Let a man but speak these things out. And folks at once label him a cynic, but it isn't true. He's like all the others, better indeed, because he isn't afraid to reveal with the light of the intelligence the red shame of human bestiality on which most men close their eyes so as not to see it. So somebody who may be guilty of this, these things, but nevertheless, at least, <laughs> has the willingness to admit it is better than those who won't be. Now the stepdaughter is disgusted by this. She says, oh, all these intellectual complications make me sick, disgusting. All this philosophy that uncovers the beast in man and then seeks to save him, excuse him. I can't stand it, sir. When a man seeks to simplify life bestially, throwing aside every relic of humanity, every chaste aspiration, every pure feeling, all sense of ideality, duty, modesty, shame, then nothing is more revolting and nauseous than a certain kind of remorse. Crocodile's tears, that's all it is. So she's still angry. I mean, anyway, the father says, for the drama lies in all in this, in the conscience that I have, that each one of us has. We believe this conscience to be a single thing, but really it's many sided. One for this person, another for that. Many consciences. So it's not as if there's just one voice inside us that warns us that certain things are wrong. One center there in the mind. They're actually, it's, for one thing, each one of us has its own, but for another, even within my mind, there may be many. And so, the mind is like, really, a series of these masks. We have this illusion of being one person for all, having a personality that's unique. But he says, it isn't true. We perceive this when, sometimes, we're suspended, we're caught up in the air. <laughs> we perceive that all of us was not in that act. There are situations where you do something and somebody says, why did you do that? And the best answer you can come up with is, I don't know. My daughter's a kindergarten teacher. Actually, an elementary school teacher at various grade levels. And kids say this all the time. But adults do it too. Why on earth did you do that? I don't know. Right? It doesn't somehow reflect who I am as if I'm reflected in that deed. That was a momentary mask. It doesn't reflect who I really am. <clears throat> the father says, we find ourselves strange to one another. 
We're living in an atmosphere of mortal desolation. When faith is lacking, we substitute ourselves for this faith. <clears throat> and so the father says, look, in the end, you've got to be the author. The manager says, what? What are you talking about? Yes, you. Why not? I've never been an author. But the father says, everybody does it. Everybody is the author of their own lives, the author of their own roles that they play every single day. So in the end, that's what you are. You are the author of your own reality.